Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm Kevin Johnson, Dean of UC Davis School of Law, and, and I want to uh, tell you all today how fortunate we all are to have UC Berkeley School of Law professor Kiara Bridges with us to talk about um, or to give the annual Bodenheimer Lecture on Family Law. Now, the Bodenheimer Lecture was established in 1981 in memory of one of the founding UC Davis Law faculty members, Brigitte Bodenheimer. Professor Bodenheimer was a renowned teacher, scholar, and law reformer. Her lecture brings leading scholars in family law from across the country every year to UC Davis. Now, today's event also is part of our Racial Justice Speaker Series, which began in fall 2020 and is now a permanent part of our annual academic calendar. The series explores the origins and impact of systemic racial injustice as it, as it pertains to all areas of law. Now, Professor Bridges' lecture, Family Law of the Poor, will examine the dual system of family law in the United States. <coughs> She observes that the U.S. has a set of laws that regulates more affluent families and an entirely different and separate and distinct set of laws that regulates poor families. And she looks at how family law for the poor is uniquely punitive. Now, Professor Bridges has written many articles on issues of race, class, reproductive rights, and their intersection. The scholarship has appeared, or soon will appear, in the Harvard Law Review, Stanford Law Review, Columbia Law Review, and many more. She's author of three books, including Reproducing Race, An Ethnography of Pregnancy as a Site of Racialization, the, Pov the, the Poverty of Privacy Rights, and Critical Race Theory, a primer. She's a co-editor of a reproductive justice book series published by the University of California Press. She graduated as valedictorian from Spelman College, received her JD from Columbia Law School, and her PhD from Columbia's Department of Anthropology. Please join me in welcoming, and I feel very privileged to have with us today, Kiara Bridges. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for, for being here both in person and virtually. Um, it is such an honor. I was telling Dean Johnson earlier that this is my first in-person lecture since March 2020, so I apologize if I'm a little rusty. <laughs> um, so the title of my talk is Family Law of the Poor. Um, and if you look at most family law case books in the US, um, and if you look at the syllabi for most family law courses taught in American law schools, um, you will likely get the sense that the rules governing marriage, divorce, child custody, and child support are in the aggregate family law. However, the laws that regulate marriage, divorce, child custody, and child support are not the only laws that regulate families. There are laws that empower state actors to investigate allegations. The laws that govern marriage, divorce, child custody, and child support are not the only laws that regulate families. Um, there are laws that empower state actors to investigate allegations of child abuse and neglect. Uh, there are statutes um, that allow for the rapid termination of parental rights when a mother or father is deemed incapable of parenting competently. There are regulations that govern the size of public assistance grants for eligible families. There are policies that prevent the expenditure of government dollars on abortion services. All of these laws undoubtedly regulate families. These laws affect the size of families. They affect the behavior of family members vis-a-vis -vis one another. However, this set of laws is almost the exclusive province of the poor. Moreover, this set of laws typically is not recognized as family law among family law scholars, at least not traditionally speaking. If an individual enjoys some degree of class privilege, she likely will never encounter any of the laws that regulate the families of the poor. She likely never will be investigated for child abuse or neglect. She likely never will be threatened with the termination of her parental rights. It will be irrelevant to her that her state caps the size of the grants that it gives to poor families receiving help from its cash assistance welfare program. It will be irrelevant to her that Medicaid does not cover the cost of abortion care. 
At the same time that wealthier people are immunized from the family law of the poor, poor people engage less frequently with the laws that regulate wealthier families. To be precise, poor people do not marry at the same rates as wealthier people. Assuming that education level is a rough proxy for income, the data appear to show that those with higher incomes have higher rates of marriage. 65% of those with a college degree are married compared with 50% of those with 12 years or less of education. In this way, the poor do not come into contact as frequently with the laws around marriage and divorce that structure the families of those with class privilege. Of course, low-income people engage with the laws around child custody and child support as often as those who are wealthier. But we still can make the broad claim that there is a body of law that more frequently impacts the families of those with some degree of class privilege Meanwhile, there is a separate body of law that regulates the families of those without class privilege. The latter set of laws, the family law of the poor, is much more punitive than the family law for those who are not poor. The body of laws that most family law courses analyze and to which the term family law traditionally refers tends to be mostly relevant to those who are not poor. That is, family law, that term, tends to refer exclusively to laws surrounding marriage, divorce, child support, and child custody. So what explains the exclusion of the family law of the poor from the family law canon? Professor Jill Haste has offered two main reasons. First, there is a truism among family law scholars that family law is local. Family law is believed to be composed primarily of state law, and to a certain extent that is true, states play a large, roles in a large role in governing families. For example, states decide the legal age of marriage in the state. States decide whether the state will be a community property regime or a common law regime when it comes to the ownership of property acquired during marriage. States decide the baseline rules around how property will be distributed upon the dissolution of a marriage in the state. They also decide how spousal support will be calculated, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, much of the family law of the poor is not state, it's federal. I offered as an example of the family law of the poor laws that govern the size of public assistant grants for eligible families. This is the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Program, or TANF for short. TANF is a federal program. I offered as another example of the family law of the poor policies that prevent the expenditure of government dollars on abortion services. That is the Hyde Amendment, which precludes federal monies from being used to cover the cost of abortion care, except where the abortion will terminate a pregnancy that is, the result of, that is the result of rape or incest, or when continuation of the pregnancy will jeopardize the life of the pregnant person. The Hyde Amendment is a federal law. Because a lot of the family law of the poor is federal, people tend to think that it is not family law because family law is supposed to be local. Nevertheless, although much of traditional family law is handed down by state courts and state legislatures, some incredibly important cases in the traditional family law canon is, are federal. So federal law plays an important role in traditional family law which is to say the fact that much of the family law of the poor is federal is not a good reason for excluding it from the family law canon. According to Professor Hasde, the second reason for the exclusion of the family law of the poor from the family law canon is that people tend to think of family law and welfare law as entirely separate categories. They think of family law and welfare law as mutually exclusive. So when judges and scholars identify a legal regulation as falling within welfare law, they presume that it cannot also be a part of family law. However, the truth is that much of welfare law is family law. The statutes, regulations, and cases that compose welfare law undeniably impact legally recognized family relationships. Nevertheless, welfare law is infrequently recognized as family law. The exclusion of welfare law from the family law canon has an important consequence. The construction of welfare law as not family law 
permits poor, poor families to be governed by a different set of principles and presumptions than those that govern wealthier families. Traditional family law is gener generally stresses the government's interest in protecting familial privacy, deferring to parental judgment, and reducing disruption of family relationships. Now, we can query whether traditional family law in practice actually does or should protect family privacy, defer to parental judgment, or reduce disruption of family relationships. Nevertheless, privacy, deference, and respect for family relationships are the professed goals. When it comes to the family law of the poor, however, that privacy, deference, and respect for family relationships cannot be found. Family law of the poor is implicitly and sometimes explicitly premised on scrutiny of family life, suspicion of parental judgment, and enthusiastic interference in family relationships. So what explains this? What explains the fact that the family law of the poor is governed by a different set of principles and presumptions than those that govern wealthier families? Why does the family law of the poor enable the state to scrutinize family life, act on suspicions of parental incompetence, and interfere in family relationships. In my scholarship, generally, I propose that the moral construction of poverty explains this. The moral construction of poverty, of poverty is the idea that people are poor because they are lazy, because they are irresponsible, because they just don't like to work, because they're promiscuous, because they're criminally inclined, and so on and so forth. This is an individualist explanation of poverty, and by that I mean that it explains poverty in terms of the individual as opposed to the institutional and structural context in which the in individual exists. The moral construction of poverty is the simple idea that people are poor because there is something wrong with them. Now keep in mind that if people are poor because there is something wrong with them, then poor families ought to be scrutinized closely and interfered with. And this is simply uh, because if people are poor because there is something wrong with them, then poor families are being headed by individuals who, as poor persons, have something wrong with them by definition. Because of the moral construction of, poor, of poverty, we tell terrible stories about the poor, and we tell even more terrible stories about poor people who start families. We have a very long history of this. We don't have to, but we could start in the 1980s. Then President Ronald Reagan warned hardworking taxpayers in the 1980s that the money that they had rightfully earned was being used to finance the lavish lifestyles of implicitly black welfare queens all over the country. Reagan often told the story of a black woman from Chicago who had, quote, 80 names, 30 addresses, 12 social security cards, and tax-free income over $150,000. Now, the actual woman that Reagan was talking about was not a garden variety cheat, but rather she was a full-fledged con artist whose other crimes included murder and kidnapping. Nevertheless, Reagan asked the public to believe that this woman represented all welfare recipients. Reagan used the figure of the welfare queen to gain popular and political support for his goal of reducing the size of social welfare programs. The welfare queen uh, came to stand for big government. And the more that he could get the public to fear and loathe the welfare queen, the more he could get the public to fear and loathe big government. So in the 1980s, in his quest for smaller government, Reagan adeptly damned poor people of color who start families. In the 1990s, then-President Bill Clinton picked up where Reagan left off. Clinton ended welfare as we knew it by helming the passage of the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. That act terminated the Aid for Families with Dependent Children Program, or AFDC for short, AFDC had provided cash assistance to indigent families since the 1950s. The Clinton-helmed Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act replaced AFDC with TANF, which I've already mentioned. TANF only reluctantly provides cash assistance to needy families. 
I see, I see this because built within the law are several mechanisms that make it clear that the state really doesn't think too highly of poor people who start families and who must then turn to the program for their economic survival. I'll mention just four of these mechanisms that show just pure animosity towards poor people who start families. The first is work requirement. TANF allows states to require poor mothers to work in order to receive cash assistance. Please note that the work involved in raising a young child is not work within the meaning of the statute. TANF makes poor mothers with young children work outside of the home without regard to the fact that it may be in their child's best interest for their mother to stay at home with them. TANF makes poor mothers with young children work outside of the home without regard to the fact that the work that a mother finds may not be able to lift her family out of poverty. Nevertheless, she has to work in order to receive welfare. The second mechanism that shows the animosity that TANF has towards poor people who start families are time limits. TANF limits the amount of time a person can receive cash benefits under the program to 60 months or five years over the course of a lifetime. Now that would be fine if people were able to lift themselves out of poverty within 60 months or five years. But the best studies show that escaping poverty takes longer than that. TANF doesn't care though. It kicks poor people off the dole whether or not they are capable of economic self-sufficiency. The third mechanism is family caps, and this is what Dandridge v. Williams concerned, which I'll discuss in a little bit. Family caps freeze the size of an indigent family's grant, even if the size of the family expands. The assumption behind family caps is that if poor people's grants don't expand when their families get bigger, then poor people won't have additional children while receiving public assistance. Empirical studies have shown that this assumption is false. Poor people are not homo economicus. They don't have children in response to financial incentives, and they don't decide not to have children in response to financial disincentives. Family camps simply end up forcing poverty upon poor children. And finally, the last mechanism that shows the animosity that TANF has towards poor people who start family um, are marriage promotion programs. TANF authorizes states to spend TANF funds on marriage promotion activities in lieu of spending those funds on actually supporting poor families. The idea is that poverty will just go away if poor people get married. The idea is that a poor mother will not need to, t to be dependent on the state if she would just go out there and find a good man to marry. So TANF funds are spent on programs that educate poor people about the wonders of marriage. Consider the very title of the legislation that implemented TANF, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. The title insists upon the personal responsibility of poor mothers who turn to the state for financial assistance. It implies, of course, that these same mothers would be irresponsible in their personal lives in the absence of the law, I'm proposing that the moral construction of poverty explains this. It explains why Congress passed a law that assumes that the, that the poor mothers who would turn to the state for assistance need to be chastised into taking personal responsibility for their lives. And the moral construction of poverty explains why the law that Congress passed insists that poor mothers with young children work outside of the home, get kicked off of welfare despite their continued need for financial assistance, need a coercive financial disincentive in order to stop them from having children and need to be strong-armed into marriage. The believability of the moral construction of poverty has not waned since Bill Clinton ended welfare as we knew it and implemented TANF in 1996. Moreover, the moral construction of poverty has continued to make the family law of the poor incredibly punitive. Consider the campaign for the 2016 Republican presidential nomination. Throughout the campaign, hopefuls Jeb Bush and Donald Trump took turns vilifying non-citizen women who would give birth to their children within the United States. 
They told us that the procreation of non-citizen women is for the sole purpose of producing anchor babies. They told us that these are children whose birthright citizenship allows them to function as anchors, weighing down their mothers within the borders of the United States, making it terribly difficult for the government to carry these women back to their countries of origin. Weighed here by their anchor babies, Bush and Trump told us that these problematically fertile women will be able to drain state coffers through their inevitable use and abuse of public resources. The rhetoric about anchor babies is consistent with Ronald Reagan's welfare queen and Bill Clinton's fulfilled campaign promise to end welfare as we know it. That is, the talk of anchor babies is just the newest iteration of an old trope that understands the families that poor people create, specifically the families of poor people of color, to be a social problem. Moreover, this rhetoric is premised on the moral construction of poverty, which proposes that poor immigrant mothers are poor because they're lazy, irresponsible, averse to work, and criminally inclined. Hence, the moral construction of poverty supports the view that poor immigrant mothers are devious con artists who are trying to get over by having babies within US borders. Further, note how this rhetoric supports the creation of a regime of punitive family law to govern the families that poor immigrant mothers create. Specifically, it justifies laws that brutally separate non-citizen mothers from their citizen children. So I would like to spend the balance of my remarks after giving you an introduction to the family law of the poor and the moral construction of poverty that explains the family law of the poor. I want to spend the balance of my remarks examining two cases within the family law of the poor canon. And those cases are Dandridge v. Williams and Wyman v. James. Dandridge v. Williams, which was decided in 1970, is a paradigmatic example of the punitive nature of the family law of the poor. Maryland participated in AFDC, which as I have already mentioned, was a precursor to TANF. And AFDC, like TANF, was responsible for providing cash assistance to indigent families. Maryland calculated a standard of need for each individual and awarded grants to families that would cover the needs of all of the individuals in the family unit. Now, families composed of six or fewer members received grants that covered everybody's uh, standard of need. However, families composed of seven or more members did not receive grants that covered everybody's need. Essentially, Maryland had capped the size of a grant that large families could receive. A couple of people in families composed of seven or more people sued. And the issue raised by the case was whether the maximum grant regulation violated the Equal Protection Clause. The court said no. It was fine. I should note that family cap policies live on in 2021. <coughs> 12 states currently have them on the books. Moreover, family cap policies take multiple forms today. Many of them do not apply solely to large families. In fact, they apply to families composed of two or more people or three people. Defenders of the family cap policy at issue in Dandridge argued that the policy was justified by four purposes. They said that it prevented families receiving public benefits from having higher incomes than families with a wage earner in the labor market. They said that it distributed the resources, the limited resources that Maryland had in such a way that the state could meet more indigent families' needs. They said that the family cap policy encouraged gainful employment. And they also said the family cap policy provided incentives for family planning. The court agreed that all of these purposes were legitimate and that the law was a reasonable way to accomplish them. There are many things I could observe about Dangerous versus Williams, but I want us to observe just two things about the ends that Maryland pursued with its family cap policy. First, we should observe the work done by the state's identification of the market for wage labor as the site of gainful employment. This identification allows the home to be understood as, the site, as a site where individuals are not employed at all, 
This, of course, devalues the labor performed within the home, labor that is traditionally and historically performed by women. Identifying the market for wage labor as a site of gainful employment denigrates the work involved in raising children and managing a household. In fact, it denies that the labor involved in cooking, cleaning, and caretaking is labor at all. Second, I would like to observe that insofar as family cap policies are justified on the grounds that they discourage welfare and uh, recipients from having additional children, that they are an incentive for family planning, they are premised on the idea that poor people would have a whole bunch of kids if not for financial disincentives like family caps. The reality, though, is that welfare-receiving families tend to be a tad bit smaller than families that are not receiving welfare. In fiscal year 2015, the average number of children among TANF recipients was 1.8. Half of the families receiving TANF had only one kid. Among families generally, the average number of children in 2015 was 1.9. So non-poor families tend to have slightly bigger families than poor families. Why is that true? Because it is, is expensive <laughs> to have children and poor families are poor. Most studies have shown that if family cap policies are justified on the grounds that they discourage welfare recipients from having children, then they do not work. The size of welfare receiving families in states with family cap policies are not smaller than the size of welfare receiving families in states without family cap policies. Which is to say, family caps do not function to stop welfare recipients from having children. Instead, family caps function to push families deeper into poverty and to punish children for the childbearing decisions that their parents make. Nevertheless, defenders justify family cap policies on the grounds that they discourage welfare recipients from having additional children. Note, though, that family law and constitutional law generally proclaims a desire to stay out of individuals' childbearing decisions. Remember that the court has said that, quote, if the right of privacy means anything, it is the right of the individual, married or single, to be free from unwarranted governmental intrusion into matters so fundamentally affecting a person as a decision whether to bear or beget a child. This was from Eisenstadt versus Bayer, decided just a year before Roe v. Wade. What family caps mean is that either the right of the individual to be free from governmental intrusion into an individual's decision whether to bear or beget a child is simply not a right that welfare receiving people bear, or the court, lawmakers, and society generally believe that governmental intrusion into welfare recipients' childbearing decisions is warranted. <laughs> they are poor and welfare dependent after all. So again, the family law of the poor explicitly sanctions laws that endeavor to disincentivize childbearing. Meanwhile, the orientation of the family law of the non-poor towards affluent individuals' childbearing decisions is one of non-involvement. The state definitely does not attempt to disincentivize childbearing by those who have class privilege. This is true even when affluent people's decisions to have additional children will cost the government money. Consider that the poorest families, because they do not have incomes, are not subjected to the federal tax code's provisions. Meanwhile, the federal tax code has never tried to disincentivize childbearing by the working class, middle income, and affluent folks who are subject to the tax code's provisions. Anyone with some familiarity with federal income tax will know this. Before tax reform in 2018, taxpayers could deduct $4,000 from their taxable income for every child that they had. There was no limit on the number of children that taxpayers could claim. To the extent that the government did not cap the number of children that taxpayers could claim, it is fair to say that the government was not actively disincentivizing taxpaying, that is, non-poor families from having children. Then Congress reformed taxes in 2018. The tax reform got rid of the $4,000 per kid deduction that taxpayers could take 
and replaced it with a $2,000 per kid tax credit. So whatever your tax bill at the end of the year, it is reduced by $2,000 for each child that you have. Please note, there is no cap on the number of children for whom you can claim a tax credit. Thus, the government is not actively disincentivizing taxpaying families from having children. In fact, one might argue that the government is actively incentivizing childbearing by taxpaying families. You do get $2,000 for every child that you have, after all. But no one makes the argument that the government incentivizes childbearing through tax credits for children. And this is because no one thinks that wealthier people would have more children simply because they get $2,000 tax credit at the end of the year. Meanwhile, politicians and jurists consistently argue that poor people will have more children if we give them $25 extra per month in welfare funds. These ridiculous assumptions about how poor people think and behave explain why the family law of the poor is as punitive as it is. So in my last couple of minutes, I want to tell you about one more case in the family law of the poor canon, Wyman versus James. This case involved a New York policy that required beneficiaries of AFDC to submit to home visits as a condition of their receipt of state funds. The stated purpose of the home visits was to ensure that a beneficiary was actually eligible for state benefits and to look for evidence of child abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Barbara James, who was receiving AFDC benefits, refused to allow a home visit. Consequently, her benefits were cut off, and she sued, claiming that the policy violated the Constitution. The question facing the court was whether conditioning AFDC benefits on a beneficiary's consent to a home visit violated the Fourth Amendment's prohibition of unreasonable searches and seizures. The court said no, home visits were fine. Please note that at the time of the case, at least 15 other states similarly conditioned welfare benefits on mandatory home visits. And in the years since the case was decided, lower courts have repeatedly relied on Wyman to uphold welfare programs that explicitly or functionally condition welfare benefits on the applicants submitting to home visits by government officials. In 2006, the Ninth Circuit relied on Wyman to uphold San Diego's practice of requiring persons who had applied for welfare benefits to submit to warrantless searches that were ostensibly designed to confirm the applicant's eligibility for assistance. The case, that Ninth Circuit case, was called Sanchez versus County of San Diego. It began after a woman named Rocio Sanchez submitted an application to receive benefits from CalWORKs, which is California's TANF program. After uh, Sanchez submitted the application, an investigator met her at her home and questioned her about her husband and where he could be found, the date of her last encounter and communication with him, and why the couple had decided to separate. That particular investigation ended after the investigator had searched her home, presumably for signs of her husband, and left so that he could ask Sanchez's neighbors some questions about Sanchez and her husband. Sanchez encountered the investigator again several days later when she returned to clean the apartment from which she had recently moved. When she arrived, the official was already there, checking the residence for sign of her husband. He questioned her further about her husband, asking her why she had never filed a domestic violence complaint and why she still spoke to his sister if the relationship had ended. The Ninth Circuit upheld the warrantless search, citing Wyman versus James as binding precedent. So again, that was a lot of poor is a little weird. <laughs> So the court in Wyman uh, upheld New York's home visit re requirement after, after accepting the argument that first, the home visit was not a Fourth Amendment search, and second, it argued that even if the home visit is a Fourth Amendment search, it is not an unreasonable search. The Fourth Amendment, of course, only prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. 
time constraints limit me from getting into all of the flaws of the course opinion in Wyman, I just want to talk about the flaws relating to that second argument on the slide, that if the visit is a search, it is not an unreasonable search. The courts claim that the home visit does not infringe the Fourth Amendment because it is not an unreasonable search flies in the face of a long line of cases affirming that the only way that a warrant, that a search is reasonable is, this, is if it is conducted pursuant to either consent or a warrant. And you might be asking yourself, well, why didn't the state just get a warrant for all of the beneficiaries whose homes they wanted to search? Because warrants have to be supported by probable cause. There has to be particularized evidence supporting the suspicion that gives rise to the search. So what would happen if the state sought a warrant to conduct home visits for all AFDC beneficiaries? The warrants would be denied as there would be no particularized evidence supporting the suspicion that gives rise to the search. The only way warrants would be granted is if a court accepts the claim that being poor and in need of public assistance makes one likely either to abuse or neglect your kid or to lie about eligibility. Justice Marshall accuses New York State and the majority of doing just that, of assuming that poverty creates a propensity for child abuse. He writes, what the majority sanction in the absence of probable cause, compulsory visits to all American homes for the purpose of discovering child abuse? Or is this court prepared to hold as a matter of constitutional law that a mother, merely because she is poor, is substantially more likely to injure or exploit her children? Marshall's dissent highlights the different treatment that the law gives to some families versus others. Although all parents are potential abusers of children, only some parents will be treated as potential abusers of children. The state will defer to parents who are wealthy, not to disturbing their right to exist unmolested in their homes, and the state will not defer to parents who are poor, insisting upon intruding into their homes in order to poke around for evidence of child maltreatment. Just to elaborate on this point a bit, New York assumed that parents not receiving welfare were fit. They respected the privacy and autonomy of these parents. State officials would not attempt to search for evidence of child abuse in their homes of parents not receiving welfare unless officials had probable cause to believe that the parents were abusive. Notably, this is consistent with traditional family law. The family law of the wealthy generally defers to parental prerogatives. It is low to undercut those prerogatives. While New York assumed that parents not receiving welfare were fit, it did not make the same assumption about parents receiving welfare. It assumed that those parents receiving welfare were unfit. New York insisted that state officials needed to visit the homes of all welfare recipients to search for signs of child abuse even when the state had no evidence that the abuse was occurring. This assumption about the fitness of wealthier parents and the unfitness of poor parents is consistent with all of the family law of the poor. It explains why the traditional family law that is for wealthier people, for wealthier families, generally stresses the government's interest in protecting family privacy, deferring to parental judgment, and reducing disruption of family relationships, and it explains why the family law of the poor is explicitly premised on scrutiny of family life, suspicion of parental judgment, and enthusiastic interference in family relationships. And as I have argued, the moral construction of poverty justifies the premises underlying the family law of the poor. I conclude now by encouraging us to imagine different possibilities. I encourage us to imagine what welfare law and the family law of the poor would look like if it was remade to be in accord with general family law principles. If we achieve this, we will live in a country that cleaves closer than the present country in living up to its purported values concerning justice for all. Thank you so much.
questions. We have the room until to, to 1.15. I understand there may be some questions coming through chat, but if people in the room, and I'll let you field them, if that's Sure, okay. absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for the standing ovation. I haven't seen people stand on Zoom ever. <laughs> <laughs> There's no emoji for that. <laughs> that must not be. Yeah, they need to add it. <laughs> um, any questions? I'm happy to talk about anything I've said, anything I haven't said. Um, yeah. Please raise your hand. Yes, Professor Justin. Well, um, thank you so much for being here, and thank you more broadly for your work to lift up this part of family law that too often gets overlooked. And this is just an aside, but I was just speaking to a student about the California Bar Exam, um, which only tests marital property, mm -hmm. which, as you explained to us, is family law of more affluent families, and literally does not test the family law that applies to most poor families. So, uh -huh. Yeah. Think about that. But um, returning to your to remarks, so you know, you drew our attention to some of the ways in which the law penalizes poor women's choices to bring more children into the families. And as you were speaking, I was just thinking of our simul the simultaneous efforts that are going on to restrict women's and particularly poor women's choices about mm -hmm. reproductive health. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of beyond the scope of your remarks, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the impact of bills like Texas's SB8. Mm -hmm. on poor women and poor women's reproductive choices. All right, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so I've always, huh, where do I begin? Um, I actually want to begin with the Hyde Amendment. <laughs> um, so I mentioned the Hyde Amendment um, briefly in, in my remarks, and the Hyde Amendment has been on the books since 1980. Um, when, the, when the court upheld its constitutionality in Harris versus McRae. And I'll repeat that the Hyde Amendment uh, prohibits uh, federal monies from being spent um, on abortion care, except in the case of uh, rape or incest, or when the termination of the pregnancy uh, will save uh, the pregnant person's life. Um, what that leaves out is that the Hyde Amendment uh, disallows federal monies from being spent even in the case where the termination of the pregnancy is necessary to conserve the pregnant person's health. Right. So there are a whole bunch of medical conditions um, that the pregnancy adversely impacts. Right. So if you have uncontrolled diabetes um, and you become pregnant, um, your diabetes might result in diabetic retinopathy, which will cause you to be blind. You lose your sight. Um, you may lose a limb, right? Uh, amputations are necessary uh, when diabetes is uncontrolled. Nevertheless, med uh, Hyde Amendment means that you can't, as a poor person, rely on your health insurance in order to prevent yourself from being maimed. Um, and then I also remind my students all the time that there are a whole bunch of things that you can't do medically as a pregnant person. Um, get a mammogram. That's one thing that you can't get when you're pregnant. Um, so a, private, a poor person who has a lump in her breast um, and would love to get it checked out uh, cannot terminate a pregnancy but using her health insurance in order to have something as basic as a mammogram. Right? So again, the, health, the Hyde Amendment has, has been on the books since 1980. And what the Hyde Amendment means is that poor people's reproductive uh, ability to control the trajectory of their reproductive lives um, it has been, has been constrained for um, three decades, four decades. And it's not until recently that the Democratic Party cared about it. Um, it was kind of like one of those accepted, duh, it's just poor people can't, whatever, yeah. Um, and now we have SB8. <laughs> and I've always felt like, you know, an SB8 for those who um, don't open up news apps on their phone, which is like a wise thing to do. Um, <laughs> but SB8 is the Texas uh, law that um, deputizes private citizens to uh, enforce uh, anti-abortion um, regulation. And it was <laughs> allowed to go into effect by both the Fifth Circuit and the Supreme Court. And now Texas uh, is, is people in Texas cannot access abortions um, if they are over six weeks uh, pregnant. And so what SB8 does is really democratize the brutality of the, of, of the Hyde Amendment. Um, I say it democratizes the, the brutality of it because now it's not just like, not just the very indigent who are being coerced into uh, 
childbearing and, and birth. Um, but now those who have some, you know, who are just not like the poorest of the poor, but now just the poor. <laughs> now, now the working class um, are, being, are being forced to carry pregnancies to term. Notice that I said the poor and the working class are being forced to carry pregnancies to term because those with class privilege will always be able to access abortion safely. And this was true before Roe v. Wade, and it'll be true after Roe falls. People with class privilege will always be able to access abortion safely. In Texas, folks with class privilege who are over six weeks pregnant, they're flying to Arizona, they're flying to Oklahoma, they're flying to California, they're flying to Europe. Um, they are able to access abortions from known and trusted uh, healthcare providers who are willing to perform the service for them despite the constraints of the law. Those who are being com compelled to carry pregnancies to term right now in Texas are the vulnerable, are people who are not white, right? These are people of color. Um, the folks who will suffer um, after uh, unsafely trying to terminate a pregnancy um, are those who are vulnerable, who are poor, are those who are people of color. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to wait to see. What I know is inevitable is when the statistics are released showing the consequences of SBA, the morbidity and mortality that SBA produces, it's going to be poor people and people of color. Um, that is the racial geography and class geography um, of abortion restrictions. So I've always, you know, abortion access is an issue of racial justice, and we ought not to forget that. Whatever Clarence Thomas said in Box versus Planned Parenthood, notwithstanding. Yeah. Thank you. One of the questions on chat is, what are your views on child support enforcement in terms of your your think your general thinking? Yeah. No. So I I mean, child support enforcement is is you know so poverty is violence <laughs> and. Um, a parent who doesn't pay child support and therefore inflicts poverty on their child um, is committing an act of violence. And so it's important um, that parents pay child support that is ordered and, and that we have mechanisms in place to enforce child support obligations. Um, that being said, uh, we ought to, you know, since the title of this talk is The Family Law of the Poor, um, we ought to be mindful of just how punitive the regimes um, of child support enforcement and collection are for poor families. And I'll just take a minute to mention um, the fact that um, in order to sign up for, for cash benefits, welfare, uh, poor mothers are compelled to list the fathers of their children um, because the state wants to collect child support from the fathers of the children. The state wants to get paid back um, for the money that it's going to uh, uh, spend in order to support a child. Um, and so note how that uh, disregards the autonomy and the agency um, of a poor mother. She might have brilliant reasons for not um, wanting to identify the father of her child. Her father of her child could be abusive. The father of her child um, could, could, they could have an arrangement where the father of the child gives, gives in kind um, or gives, or gives uh, instead of providing cash, uh, provides services, buys shoes, buys clothes, whatever. Um, poor people have good reasons for organizing uh, their intimate lives in the way that they do. That, that they do. Um, but requiring poor mothers to identify the father of the child in order to receive welfare disallows them from organizing their lives in the ways that they think is best um, and denies their autonomy and agency. And then there is the fact that uh, when a child support order is, is uh, in place um, and for, for a child that is receiving uh, welfare, for a family that is receiving welfare, the state pays itself back. Um, so the money that a, uh, that a non-custodial parent uh, pays in child support doesn't go to the child, it goes to the state because the state wants to be reimbursed um, for, for its expenses. And what that does is disincentivize uh, uh, non-custodial parents from paying child support in the first instance because their money's not even going towards their child. Um, and it also denies 
the fact that the state has an obligation to, to, to care for vulnerable people. Um, that's, in my view, that's the point of the state. <laughs> the state is here to support marginalized and vulnerable people and to privatize dependence in that way, to insist um, that child support is a private duty as opposed to um, an act that a well-funded um, and industrialized nation ought to do for its citizens. Uh, it's just inconsistent with what I think our values are um, as a nation. Yeah, thank you for the question, Zoomer. <laughs> Another Zoomer question. How, how do you best advocate for women and young girls uh, in, with respect to family law of the poor? Well, I think the first, the first way you advocate for it is by calling out what's happening. Um, I think that you know, as uh, Professor Jocelyn's question, I think that a lot of people are, are unaware <laughs> of, of just how punitive and harsh and, and just mean uh, the family law of the poor is. And so I think raising awareness um, about how the law treats uh, you know, women and, and girls and, and you know, people with the capacity for pregnancy, people who are parenting, um, I think that's kind of like the first step. I think that, I mean, in my scholarship, I like to show the inconsistencies. Um, I like to, you know, like the stark contrast, you know, and the brilliant example that I gave with tax reform, I'm just kidding. No, but the example that I gave with tax reform and how we don't disincentivize childbearing among um, wealthier families, but we do explicitly do it for poor families, showing the inconsistencies and in, 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 in looking as to how you can reconcile those inconsistencies that then shows the assumptions underlying um, um, the rules. And perhaps those assumptions, like right, revealing the assumptions, the fact that we think that poor people are poor because there's something wrong with them, perhaps that will um, cause us to be dissatisfied with the status quo, um, cause us to want to seek you know, legal reform, um, cause us to want to, to you know, engage in social movements around these, these issues. Um, I mean, that, that's how I advocate. Um, as a scholar, but of course there are, you can do more direct service. Um, there are a host of organizations. I'd love to use this platform as an opportunity to talk about you know, uh, organizations that are out there uh, working hard <laughs> against the family law of the poor. Um, I didn't mention in this lecture the family regulation system, also known as the child protective, you know, child, child protective services or child welfare system. Um, that, is a, or that is a system that is <clears throat> for poor people in the sense that the only folks who find themselves within the family regulation system are poor. Um, the system is incredibly punitive. It, I mean, it's, it, 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 it splits families up. <laughs> um, I mean, that's what it literally does. It splits families up. It doesn't provide services to families. Um, completely inconsistent with traditional family law, which is all about you know, not disturbing family relationships. Um, and there are a host of organizations. One, raising awareness about that fact. Um, when uh, we were all, I would hope, appalled by the separation of families at the border, um, a lot of folks were like, okay, you guys are appalled, but family separation is happening away from the border. Um, it's happening in the Bronx, it's happening in Oakland, it's happening everywhere. Um, so we can raise awareness about these issues. Um, and also, um, also uh, underscore that it's not achieving what it's designed to achieve, which is child protection. Children are harmed when they're taken away from their families, especially when they're taken away from their families only because their families are poor. Yeah, thank you. I think we've run out of time. Thank you for everything. Thank you.